This right here is a 100 amp hour AGM deep cycle battery from Renogy. And this 12 volt battery is the battery that's gonna be powering all of the electronics inside of our van. Except that it's not the battery that we ordered from Renogy. In fact, it's not even the same battery chemistry. And this is a battery that they do not sell on their website anymore. When we originally filmed this video, we had ordered a 100 amp hour Renogy lithium iron phosphate battery. After a month of poor communication with Renogy and not receiving the battery, we've decided to cancel our order with Renogy. All the other products we've received from them so far work perfectly fine, but unfortunately, just with the lack of communication, we didn't want to continue to pursue using their batteries. So instead, we reached out to Connor at Linac and decided to order a 200 amp hour True Series lithium iron phosphate battery from him. This video isn't sponsored by Linac or Renogy, but we just wanted to give a huge shout out to Linac for making our lives a lot easier and bringing power to our new van home. Connor is based out of Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is really close to home. And in a year where it matters most to support small businesses, we couldn't be more excited to be working with someone from our own home province. Now, if you know anything about 12 volt batteries, you would understand why we chose lithium. There's a couple main reasons. Lithium batteries do not suffer from voltage drops under load, which make them highly efficient for use with things such as an induction or high power devices. Lithium also have a much longer lifespan, which is beneficial for us because we'll be able to keep this battery for a longer period of time without having to replace it, which is better for the environment and better for us on a cost basis. It's worth a little extra money up front to purchase a lithium battery in order to give yourself some more longevity out of your battery bank. Oh, and did we mention they also weigh a lot less? Today we are going to be using this battery right here to test all of the electronics inside of our vehicle. And then we're going to get to a little bit of van wiring because I know that there's a lot of questions around 12 volt systems for vans. But before we get to that, I just want to talk about how we're planning on getting household electrical power inside of our van. We've purchased a 2000 watt inverter from Renogy. That's going to give us all the power we need to charge our phones, charge our laptops and run the induction that we are planning on running inside of our van. This 2000 watt inverter came with multiple four gauge cables that have been crimped together, which gives us the equivalent of a two aught cable. And it looks like it's pretty high quality multi-stranded copper. It's come with the 2000 watt inverter from Renogy. So we are gonna go ahead and use that because two aught cable is rated for 200 amps, which is essentially what this 2000 watt inverter can draw from a battery if you max it out. We are gonna make sure this inverter works as advertised to make sure that we don't have any problems later. So I'm gonna go ahead and connect to the positive and negative terminals of the battery. I've already connected to the positive and negative of the inverter. Be very careful not to cross terminals because that is how you can end up with a short and fry out your electronics. So once I connect the positive, we're good to go ahead and connect the negative terminal of the battery, which will complete the circuit and we'll turn the inverter on. I had to put a toque on, it's really cold out here. It is December though. We have completed our circuit now. We can go ahead and turn on the inverter and I'm gonna plug in my iPhone to make sure that it's actually working. So when we turn this inverter on, we should get a green light and then I'm gonna go ahead and plug in my iPhone charger and see if it charges my iPhone. That is a good sign. We have one green light and it's beeped only once. And we have a charge. That is a very, very good sign. That means our 2000 watt inverter should be good to go. Outlet number two works. And outlet number three works. Now, one thing that will make our life a little bit more comfortable compared to when we lived in the minivan is actually having this full on 12 volt power system. There's a lot of things that we're gonna be able to do now because of this power that we didn't have before. We are gonna have two USB charging stations in 12 volt, which we haven't purchased yet, but this van, is gonna have pot lights. And these little LEDs are rated for three watts, but they are surprisingly bright. I went ahead last night and tried out my series wiring connection. Basically all I've done is wired all the positives and all the negatives together. What I've done is taken some extra 16 gauge wire here so I can drop them into the battery terminals. Do not do this at home. I don't recommend it, nor would I ever do this in the actual wiring of the van because these, uh, this is just not safe, but I'm gonna be using my alligator clips to clip on some 16 gauge wire that we were working with yesterday and then drop it into the battery terminal. That didn't work. <laughs> and when you're dealing with 12 volt, you'll always wanna connect your positive into your terminal first and then your negative. These lights here are actually really bright. I'm really impressed for three watts. It's like nothing, a 12 volt system, that's like 
a quarter of an amp. So running four of these for an hour, one amp. One thing we knew that was gonna be really important to us in building this van is being able to carry enough food to go off the grid for weeks at a time. And one of the key components of that is going to be our fridge. The amount that the fridge can store is sufficient for us to keep at least a week's food so that we can go into more remote places where it's harder to get groceries and also to make sure that if anything were to happen to us and we were to break down, we had enough resources to survive for a few days. This Dometic fridge is a compressor fridge, which means it is very efficient I don't really understand a whole lot about it, but Richard has given me the green light that it will work in our power setup without drawing too much power. We're also working with a really small space, so choosing the CRX65 was just the right size to fit into our little kitchen that's gonna be no more than four feet big. The last thing that we're adding into our kitchen that uses power is our induction cooktop. We won't be building an induction cooktop into our counter, and this will allow us to interchange between propane and induction when energy constraints might be a concern. Other than that, we're pretty simple people. We don't really need anything else fancy to keep us going. There'll be things we'll need to run in the future like a diesel heater if we continue to try and live in Canadian winter. We're mainly concerned about the functionalities that will help us stay off the grid for extended periods of time. The most important question I know everyone is wanting the answer to is how are we gonna power this? We are making the crazy decision to forego solar. For us, the most practical way to get energy is from a DC to DC charger. We're going to be spending a lot of time in the mountains, in forested areas, and honestly, a lot of time in Canada, which means harboring solar energy is not always going to be practical for us. We need to look towards alternatives for us to generate power, and that comes down to two main sources. The first is the DC to DC charger, and the second is shore power. If we lived in the southern United States, or if we ever get to go to the southern United States, we will strongly consider putting solar on our roof. But for now, we feel like this is by far the most practical and cost-effective decision we can make, especially when you will need to go like 40 kilometers in the backcountry, and it takes you two hours you may as well use the alternator that is producing power anyways. So we've chosen the Renogy 40 amp DC to DC charger. That should do the trick just fine and it stays well within the safety limits of our van's alternator because we do not have a high output alternator nor do we have a second alternator. These DC to DC chargers are great because they actually regulate the voltage and boost it to the 14.6 volts that you need to charge your lithium battery. And after a few months on the road, I think we'll get a good idea as to whether solar is something that we need in the future. Perhaps the most critical part of the electrical component of this van build is choosing the appropriate wires because, well, this is a vehicle that moves. If you use your standard household wire in this van, they might fray and crack and break over time. So we've went ahead and purchased marine grade copper wire. This came from Angkor. It is exactly what you want. It's meant to handle marine situations with lots of vibration and salt water. So we think this will be perfect for us in the van. If you're wondering how to size your wires, Angkor has a wiring chart. I will link that calculator in the description below and I can highly recommend this wire already. It is sturdy and it looks like it is made indestructibly. We're also gonna be using this 12 volt positive and negative bus from Blue Sea Systems to wire all of our 12 volt stuff. It is a blade fuse holder, which means you can put fuses in to protect all of your positive or your hot lines that are running into your loads. And there's 12 options for positive and 12 options for negative bus with your master positive and your master negative here. So this is essentially perfect for what we are looking to do. It can handle well over a hundred amps, which we are not gonna be using that kind of a load at any time. Before we go ahead and actually run wires inside of the van, I wanna just do a quick rundown of all the tools that we need to make sure that we get this job done correctly before we go ahead and hide them behind the wall paneling and roof paneling of our van. So the very first thing we need is some tools. This right here is a wire cutter and wire stripper. It cuts the wires with these teeth here, and then it has different options for different thickness of wires or different gauges of wires, all the way from 20 gauge to 10 gauge in multi-stranded copper, which is what we're gonna be using here. We also have this ratcheting crimp tool that I purchased from Amazon. It can crimp your standard electrical connections, red, blue, and yellow, which can crimp again all the way down to 10 gauge. And as I was talking about the hydraulic crimper, the Amazon guy decided to show up and bring me the hydraulic crimping set. I'm excited because this actually means I can crimp all of the wire that we're ever gonna need to use in this camper van and get perfect, perfect, perfect connections. Amazon, I'm really impressed. I ordered this 
Friday night and today is Sunday. By Friday night, I mean like 11 p.m. It was like almost mid, it was almost Saturday. And the crimping set's already here. I can't believe it. We're also using this plastic electrical conduit to further protect the wires as we run it through the vans and we will show you that shortly. And we've also purchased a bag of zip ties. This is pretty straightforward. It's just to keep the wires into the ceiling so that they can't rattle around and potentially get damaged in the roof of our van. We also have some standard electrical terminal kits. This one here is just standard electrical terminals. We purchased this from Home Depot and it does from 22 to 10 gauge. And this kit here was purchased from Amazon, especially because these are what we call piggyback connections. They allow two other lines to connect onto the line that's crimped here, which means we can connect three lines together. And that's gonna be a big help when we're wiring our lighting. Now I've gone ahead and done some of the initial easy cabling here and run it through conduit across the ceiling stud there. But today I need to go ahead and finish the last of it, which is actually the hardest. I'm gonna be running a ground wire all the way to the Ford Transit's grounding terminal point over there. And I have to also wire a lighting setup for over our bed, as you can see right there. I've already used this stud to its full wiring potential. I've even created the connection here for the fan and I've run the wires to a light that's going to be right here. And I've also run the wire to a USB socket that's gonna be in the bench right here. So what I need to do now is use this stud right here to run my ground wire and also to run this sheathing to protect not only the ground wire, but the 16 gauge wire we're gonna be using to put a light right here, a light here, and also a light here so that we actually have light over our bed and over our bench area for when it's dark outside, especially in Canadian winters. It just seems to be really dark here all the time. I'm gonna take both of these lines and actually tie them with electrical tape. This is gonna make it easier for me to pull both lines oh. through the sheathing. This conduit is not the size that we wanted. We wanted an inch thick conduit and this conduit's only a half inch. It can be difficult at times, but it is pre-split. So if I run into any issues here, I can just fix it. I finally have both lines here all the way through the conduit, but I'm just gonna keep pulling until I have it exactly where I want it. Try not to mess it up like I just messed it up. That's unfortunate. Our conduit is now secured to the ceiling. I've pulled the wires through to make sure that I have the exact length that I need. I've cut off a tiny little bit of conduit for the ground wire where it's going to be running. Along the metal side of the van, this 10 gauge ground wire does not have a secondary coat of insulation like all of our marine wire does, so I want this to be extra protected. Making sure this connection is really nicely cleaned, stripped, and crimped so that it can be attached to this ground port here is gonna be extremely important. And that's where our tools come into play. So first, I'm gonna find the appropriate gauging, which this is 10 gauge multi-stranded wire. And I am going to just peel it back. Right here is why having the right tool for stripping your wire is so important. As you can see, I've not done any damage to the copper wire here, which means the path for electricity to flow through this wire has not been compromised. So I've got the crimping tool exactly where I want it. I'm gonna feed the wire in. And I'm going to crimp those together. I'm really excited to get this part of the electrical done so that we can move on to some more vanity projects like putting up walls and roofs and cabinets and painting, Ugh, fun stuff. And I have one more job left to do, which is to splice into the lighting lines. We've decided to have three separate circuits. One circuit is gonna be in the kitchen under the cupboards, which I don't have to wire quite yet. The second circuit I've already run the wire for, which will have a switch by the door. And the final three lights are going to be over the bed, which is what I'm about to splice into. We are gonna be offering a preliminary wiring diagram in the description for this video, as well as the series wiring for our lights, just in case you're confused and have any questions about that. I'm also going to be offsetting the positive and the negative connections so that there's a much smaller possibility of a short happening. It's worth the extra safety precautions because we are going to be living inside of this thing after all. These are those weird disconnects that I've been talking about. This is what's gonna allow us to connect our master line to the other side of the master line that I cut, as well as the third line that's gonna run to the lights. The special thing about this is that it accepts a male disconnect on one end and a female disconnect on the other end, as well as the line that we're crimping. Wire in there. And crimp her down. There we go. 
It's exactly what we want to see right there. So the tug test tells us this is a successful crimp. There's no way that's coming out, especially when we put electrical tape on it. Bingo, bingo. Perfect, tug test agrees. I have carefully connected all the positives and all the negatives together. We've actually taped our lights up to the ceiling. This is just a little test run for us and I'm gonna go ahead and connect the negative and the positive here on my piggyback terminal. Well, here goes nothing. That's the positive. And that is lighting in our van. Think that's bright enough? Yeah. Borderline, eh? It's borderline. A special shout out to all our patrons for making these kinds of videos possible. I know this one was a little different than our usual one, but I felt like it was really important to address this electrical situation because it's something that, well, it's just not always explained that well on YouTube and it's such a critical component of building a van out properly. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something. It's starting to rain now, so I'm gonna get cleaned up in here, go in and have something warm to eat and we will see you in the next video. Bye.